Thank you, Beth. And uh, I just want to reiterate her point that I'm so delighted to see all of you out here tonight on a Tuesday night to uh, learn some science. So my goal tonight is to describe the history of the universe, the subsequent 10 trillion years of the universe, and humanity's place in the universe. So maybe we should get started. <laughs> so as you've probably heard, the uh, universe began with what has been euphemistically known as the Big Bang, which is basically an explosion in which all the mass and matter and energy in the universe exploded into the scene. It is our entire universe. It started from a point, and it's, the universe has been expanding ever since. And everything in the universe was in this explosion. But the funny thing about the explosion was that it wasn't completely uniform and smooth. There were these little knots that were a little bit, uh, a little bit over dense. There was a little bit more matter in these, in these spots. And these became the seeds of galaxies. And uh, in this lovely video that I'm showing here by uh, my, my colleague Fabio Governato at the University of Washington, you can see what happens here. All these little knots, they all merge together. This is how galaxies form. And what I hope you sort of get a picture from, or an idea from this uh, movie, is that it's a pretty messy process. And you wouldn't really call this a, a sort of a calm universe that we live in. This is, of course, billions of years of evolution you're seeing in just a matter of a couple of drinks of your beer. But the point is, is that you would not really describe our universe as a calm, equilibrium kind of place. It is a, what we, the technical term is we call the universe clumpy. And uh, what that means is that we see lots of spots where there's no matter and lots of places where there is a lot of matter. And this is where, and you see these, and you can see that the simulations that my colleagues have uh, produced are fantastic. This looks a lot like a galaxy you might see in a, in a magazine. But what you also notice, I hope, is that the universe is in this disequilibrium state. This means that it's out of whack. It's just, uh, it's a little bit odd that, because when you think about your own experiences, you probably feel like things tend to move towards equilibrium in our world. If you throw a big rock into a pond, it produces a lot of ripples, but those ripples dissipate and you get back to a nice calm lake. It seems as though the universe is the opposite when we look at it, in that there seems to be matter and energy being funneled into galaxies. It seems as though things are moving towards this disequilibrium state. But there is a limit to that, and that occurs in stars. Stars are the great equalizer in our universe, and they are trying their best to move the universe into a more kind of equilibrium state. What do I mean by that? It would be a situation in which the entire universe was very smooth. There would not be galaxies, not even stars. It would be a very just homogeneous place. Stars, however, are doing their best to try and alleviate this situation. They're trying to convert matter into energy. And they do that by basically fusing hydrogen into helium in their cores. And that's, that process reduces the mass of a star, and, and it gives that energy back to the universe. And it distributes it evenly all across the surface of the star. It is moving that matter, all that disequilibrium, back into trying to smooth out the universe. This turns out to be great for life in the universe because planets like to orbit stars, and they can intercept all that energy. They sort of live downhill. They get, they get to try and absorb some of this energy. And this leads to a concept that probably a lot of you have heard about called the habitable zone. Everybody heard of the habitable zone in here? Just a show of hands. Oh, well, yeah, not too many. All right, well, the habitable zone, let me explain it to you, is a, uh, it's a, it's a critical concept of today's talk. And the habitable zone is a region around a star in which we believe life can exist on a planet. This is a, uh, this is a schematic of a habitable zone of a, of a planetary system that's about 22 light years away called, sorry, Gliese 667c. I'm sure you'll remember that tomorrow. But the point is, is that there are a lot of planets orbiting this system. And if they live in one of these colored regions, we might think they're habitable. And basically, oh, I don't want to get too far away here. Sorry, guys. Um, the, uh, this green region is where we think habitability is most likely. There's these three planets that are orbiting in the green region are our best bets for habitability. We don't really know where the, uh, the edge of the habitable zone is. Maybe this red region is possible, but it might be too hot because it's too close to this star represented by this uh, red dot here in the center. And it might, be, it might extend a little farther out where this uh, icy blue cold color is. It might, be, it might extend out that far. Um, the point here is, is that there are probably three, maybe even five habitable planets orbiting this uh, star system. And this, this was just discovered this year. The other thing I think that's interesting about this figure that I hope you all can see is that this gray line here, this gray circle, is 
basically the uh, orbit of Mercury in this system. So here, this habitable zone is much closer in than our habitable zone, which we're standing in, because we our planet is beyond Mercury's orbit by a quite a distance. And so in the habitable zone, these planets absorb about the right amount of energy from their star that they might be able to support life. All right, so what do I mean by that exactly? What makes a planet habitable? We've, we've maybe, you know, this is, a, as, a, as Beth said in the introduction, this is a hot topic right now, and you maybe you occasionally see this in, a, in the newspaper that maybe we found a new habitable planet. There's really three requirements we think we need for a habitable planet. The first is liquid water. All life on Earth requires liquid water to grow and thrive. The next, in next ingredient are what we call bioessential elements. And there's six elements on, on Earth that all living organisms have in their bodies. They are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, sometimes referred to as schnapps, which is, of course, a great name at a bar. Uh, so I wanted to make sure I included that here. Um, just please nobody order any sulfur schnapps. I don't think that'll, that'll probably not taste very good. But anyway, this is, these are sort of the, uh, the elemental ingredients that, that we need to, uh, to have life in the universe. And finally, there is this energy. We need energy. And that's really going to be the focus of my talk today. So there's a couple interesting things then to realize is that, well, life needs a constant, stable energy source. The key is, is that we need to have liquid water for a long amount of time. So that's why it's critical where the habitable zone is. It's really defined on this concept, is that we need enough energy that any w ice is transformed into liquid water, but none of that liquid water, or at least very little of that liquid water, is transformed into water vapor. It's that sweet spot where you can have liquid water, where it's not too hot and not too cold. There's another interesting thing, I think, about this, and that is that, really, since we need this energy, we need the universe to be in this disequilibrium state, where it can absorb the, the energy that stars are giving off trying to equilibrate the universe. And I think this is an underappreciated fact about astronomy and about uh, our, uh, our universe, is that this, un this uh, disequilibrium in the universe has necess necessarily been transferred onto all of us. So if ever you feel like your life is a little out of balance, or maybe a little bit in disequilibrium, just remember it has to be, because the universe is that way. So I don't want to give all of you too many excuses, but the point here is, is that there's a reason for that. Life is and the universe are constantly evolving, and that has to be the way it is because it's the way the universe is. Now, I talked about energy from above here, from the star. We need that energy source. Well, there's an interesting uh, result that's come out of the last couple decades of uh, Earth science and astrobiology, and that is that we actually probably need energy from below as well in order to produce this great atmosphere that gives us this constant, stable, source of liquid water, or this constant possibility of liquid water. So this is probably going to be my most complicated slide of the talk, so please bear with me for a minute. So one thing you, we all appreciate here in the Pacific Northwest is that there are volcanoes. And you know, at least some of us maybe remember, or at least we're familiar with the big explosion about 35 years ago when Mount St. Helens erupted. And we know that uh, when, when there's an eruption, we it, eject a huge amount of material, sort of gas and dust and ash. And it, it, one of the primary components of a volcano, of a volcanic eruption, is carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide might be familiar to you because this is our main culprit for man-made global warming on Earth. Humans are basically uh, producing uh, coal factories that are outgassing carbon dioxide the same way a volcano does, just at a much lower scale. So carbon dioxide is a great way to warm our planet. Now, we've only been on the scene doing this for a few hundred years. The Earth has been around for four and a half billion years, pumping carbon dioxide into our atmosphere nonstop. So then the question becomes, well, why haven't we already suffered from that? Why is the Earth not completely overheated already? And it's because there is an internal energy source in our Earth that is actually helping to take that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And so this has turned out to be a revelation uh, in astrobiology because we now realize that we need to have this energy source. And let me just try and walk you through this very quickly, how this argument works, is that carbon dioxide is ejected out of a volcano. There's all this carbon dioxide, and by the way, CO2 in this, in this plot refers to carbon dioxide. So this carbon dioxide gets into the atmosphere. It then interacts with raindrops that are 
floating, and of course we're familiar with this in the Pacific Northwest as well, there's a lot of rain in the atmosphere, and the carbon dioxide finds its way into the raindrops, and it kind of hangs out in there. Then eventually that rain falls to the ground, the carbon dioxide ca is carried with it, and as the carbon dioxide moves down the streams and into the oceans, it has a chance to chemically react with whatever sort of rocks and such are, are on the ground. And, it, and it, carbon dioxide really likes calcium, and it actually is able to bond chemically with calcium and form a mineral called calcium carbonate. Now, calcium carbonate is a mineral, and a mineral is just a fancy word for a rock. So when that gets into the ocean, that rock is just going to sink to the bottom. So now we've taken that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and it's no longer contributing to trying to warm the planet. But then what happens is that interior to the Earth, which is down here, this red area, there's a, there's a whole bunch of magma and energy that's actually trying to push the surface of our planet around. It is this energy that is helping to drive what we call plate tectonics. And this rocks, this calcium carbonate mineral that's on the surface of the ocean, or excuse me, on the sea floor of the ocean, eventually moves towards a continent where it is subducted, meaning that the ocean floor is actually pulled below the surface of the continents, where it finally melts again, the carbon dioxide is released, and then there's an eruption and the carbon dioxide flies up into the atmosphere again. So the point here is that there is a, an important mechanism by which we can keep our planet habitable, but it requires energy from below. And so when we think about planetary habitability, we need to find places where there's the right amount of energy from above, from a star probably, as well as from below. And it's very tricky to measure the interior of a planet that's maybe 100 light years away, but yet nonetheless, this is the, the problem that we're confronted with in uh, the current st status of astrobiology. So if we have these energy sources and we need energy to survive, the question then becomes, well, when does it strike midnight on planet Earth? When do we run out of all this energy? So how about the interior of the Earth? How long do we have left until this internal energy source is gone? Anybody have an idea? Who knows how long it, it will be until the Earth's energy is gone? I can drink all night. <laughs> 60 million years? Is that, or was it 60 million something else? 60 million years? That is, that's a good guess. Anybody else have any other? Anybody else know? 80 billion. That's a great, that's a long time. Yeah. All right, well, I, was, I don't know. Do, do either of you actually know? Because I don't know. In fact, <laughs> we don't really know how long it is. Um, maybe several billion years. The, the, the tricky part is that we can measure how much energy is coming out of the Earth quite well, but we don't actually know what the sources are. It's a little bit trickier to figure out what's going on. There's multiple sources of energy, and we don't know what their relationships are, and we don't know necessarily, so we don't necessarily know how long it's going to last. So there's a bit of a question mark here, but it's probably several billion years. You have time to finish your drink. <laughs> but you know, there is a, the clock is ticking on the internal energy. So how about the sun? Does anybody know how long we have left before the sun goes out, as the uh, talk is called? Seven billion years. Anybody else? Friday. Oh, my God. <laughs> I hope that's not true. <laughs> a, a reasonable guess, though. It might, might happen. Anybody else? Two billion. Yeah, so you guys are, you know, aside from Friday, you guys are in the right ballpark. It's, we actually know this number very well. It's about five billion years. Uh, so, again, you know, you don't have to really worry about this in a, too much, <laughs> you know, unless it's your job to worry about it like me. But um, the point is here is that, you know, we don't really know how long the, the Earth's interior is going to have energy, but it could be quite a long time, whereas we know that the sun is done in five billion years. So we don't have any more than five billion years left. So sounds, that doesn't sound too bad. But I guess, but the point of the talk today that I wanted to try and share with you today is to think about the question, well, then what? What do we do in five billion years? It's sort of like Y2K all over again. You know, we have to somehow deal with this problem. What are we going to do? Well, I have an idea, and it's probably what you're thinking too, and that is, why don't we get off of this rock? <laughs> we're going to have to move eventually. And so we're eventually going to have to find our way off of this planet because the Earth is going to not be habitable forever. And five billion years sounds like a long time, but I will try somewhat facetiously tonight to convince you that we really need to, to get a move on. So if you were to ask, 
where's the best place to go in the galaxy for, to, to, to live? Well, you'd want to find some place that's going to have energy for a very long time. So the best real estate in the galaxy is going to be the place that has the longest energy supplies. So if we look at our sun on this scale, I'm plotting here the lifetime of a star in terms of its mass relative to our sun. So the sun is right here at 1, and it, has, it survives about 10 billion years. Uh, well, we don't really want to go to a star that's 10 times more massive than the sun because it's only going to live 10 million years. That's, those guys are long gone. However, at the smaller end, we're in good shape. 10 trillion years. <laughs> those, those stars are awesome. Let's go there. And so we need to find those l tiny little stars that might have, and this is about as small as stars can be, so we need to find those little stars. So from above, we want to find a small mass star. What about from below? Well, as I said, we really can't do much for the Earth. I mean, it's got, you know, it's got these energy sources, but they're not going to last more than a few billion years. M no more than 10 for sure. It's 10 billion years sounds great, but it is a lot less than 10 trillion. Well, it turns out there's another way to make internal energy on a planet, and that's through a process called tidal heating. And uh, this is something that we've seen in our solar system, we, so we know this is viable, but it's going to be a little tricky to find it on the right exoplanet. So this is a, a great movie of Io that I love that shows you this enormous volcano going off on, on Io. Io is the most volcanically active object in our solar system. It's a moon of Jupiter. And the reason why, and even though Io is about 10 or 100 times smaller than our own moon, it's incredibly active, and it's because of this tidal heating. It's actually driven by this bizarre orbital effect where the other, there's a few other moons of Jupiter that are tugging on Io. So this is Io here in the middle going around, and then there's these other couple of satellites named Europa and Ganymede, and they pull on, on Io's orbit, and they make it just a little bit non-circular. It turns out that that is actually what's driving this enormous heat flow. If you were to look at the orbit of Io, it would look like a circle. But it's just off enough that it drives this tidal heating. And what's going on here is, is that as Io moves from being a little bit closer to Jupiter to a little bit farther away, the gravitational force from Jupiter is so strong that it's actually causing Io's shape to bend. It's causing its surface to flex a little bit. That's causing heating from the interior and it's driving this spectacular volcanism. So this heat source doesn't go away, at least not for very, very long times. I mean, 10 trillion years is what we're, we're looking at for how long maybe this could survive on an exoplanet. So if we could find an exoplanet that was orbiting a very tiny star in its habitable zone with this long-lived tidal heating, maybe not at Io's level. Io actually resurfaces with, mag or with lava about every 10,000 or 100,000 years, so I don't think that's a great place to live, but maybe if we had, could get a little bit less, we might be able to actually find a place that's worth moving to. So here's the bottom line. I think that if we're going to think about how to move beyond the Earth, we need to find a planet in the habitable zone of a very tiny star that is being perturbed by another planet in that system such that it is getting a, a modest amount of tidal heating. Not as much as on Io, maybe about as much as we see on Earth today. We have a lot less uh, heating on the interior than Io does today. So this is, I think, the perfect planet we want to look for. And for all of you who love Earth, I'm afraid I don't think that the Earth is the best planet in the galaxy to live on. We want to find this one. So all we need is a spaceship, right? Let's get going. Well, if you think about this, this is a pretty hard proposition. So the fastest spacecraft humanity has ever built was called Helios 2. It reached this staggering velocity of 160,000 miles per hour relative to the sun. Of course, it didn't have anybody on board. It was just a science mission looking at the sun. But this is as fast as we've been able to go so far. So the nearest star that is in that sort of 10% the mass of our sun range is, has this name that only an astronomer could love, SCR 1835-63. I hope you've all scribbled that down on your, uh, your napkin tonight. This is our closest bet to try and find one of these planets that might be ideal. It's about 13 light years away. So traveling at just 160,000 miles an hour, it'll take 60,000 years to get there. That is a long time. And it's, a, it's getting on the order of how long Homo sapiens have been on the Earth. You know, it's, a it's certainly less than that by a factor of a few, but it's getting to be a long time. So this is by no means... Uh, an easy proposition, and I want to try and not 
delve too far into science fiction in this talk today. I want to think about sort of what we can do right now and just how daunting this might be. But, you know, if we were to try and at least imagine that we could propel humans at this velocity, it would take two or three thousand generations of humans living in deep space to actually make it to a planet like that. But of course, we don't even know if there's a planet around that star yet. <laughs> you know, we don't know if there's a planet in the habitable zone of that star yet. We don't know even know if that planet could be habitable if it were there. And finally, we don't even know if there could be another planet in that system that would give us that perfect little sweet spot of tidal heating that would allow us to maintain that internal energy for, for a long period of time. This is basically the forefront of astrophysics right now, is we are trying to find these planets. So I'm confident we're going to find them in the next decade to century or something like that. The problem is just going to be find that perfect system where we could actually be long, we could actually live for a very long time. So we need to somehow be able to explore our galaxy uh, to a, with with lots of people on board spaceships and exp and try and find these great planets that might be able to survive for for a very long time. So what we actually need is a better spaceship, <laughs> not my little cartoon drawing of a spaceship. We need this spaceship that can explore the galaxy for a long time and keep a lot of people alive. And I happen to know of a spaceship like that. Do you guys know it? The Enterprise. The Enterprise. Well, that's a good <laughs> choice. I'm trying to avoid science fiction. That's a good guess. The Earth. I think the Earth is a great spaceship. I don't know if you guys think about the Earth as a spaceship, but I do all the time. It is a, it is a fascinating way to think about our planet. It is a, a huge, as I've just explained, vastness of space out there. And yet we are here, kept alive by this amazing planet. And you know, what better place to survey the galaxy than from Earth? <laughs> you know, we can just do it from our own backyard. Uh, our planet circles our galaxy once every 250 million years, so it's having no problem going through our, our galaxy. Um, so if the Earth, Sun has about 5 billion years left, uh, if I've done my math right here, I think we have about 20 orbits around our galaxy before the Sun goes out. If we look at the stars in our local neighborhood in the galaxy, we find that it looks to be that about every 125,000 years, one of these very tiny stars is going to come within about 10 light years, which point we'd, ha we'd need about 30,000 years to get there. So we actually run into them fairly often, and so about the amount of time it takes us right now to travel to one of these stars is about how often we will have another chance to try and get to one. We'll see about 2,000 every time we go around our galaxy, and maybe before the sun blows up, or the sun runs out of energy, we'll actually be able to survey about 40,000 new stars. Now, we might see some of them again, because we'll probably come up around a couple times uh, as we go around the galaxy, but we have, uh, we have a lot of options out here, perhaps. And I think one of the interesting things is that, of course, we can observe, observe these planets from afar, pick out the ones that we think are interesting, and then maybe try and think about how we might move a significant fraction of humanity off the planet to one of these other stars. So this is sort of the general idea. This is our galaxy. And this red path here is the, uh, s the path of the sun and, uh, of course, the Earth by extension around the galaxy. And these little red lines are maybe the paths that humanity might take at some point. You know, it'll, be, it'll be a little bit random, but I think with 2,000 or per, per orbit or maybe 40,000 in total, we're going to find a few options where maybe we will find that, that sweet spot and we'll be able to try and, and find these planets. And you know, I kind of wonder if, you know, if this is the best real estate in the galaxy, we might want to find it sooner rather than later because we don't want to get into a bidding war over those planets. <laughs> war being the operative word here, I really think, you know, we might want to try and find these, these planets as soon as we can. So what might life be like on one of these worlds? Well, it would be very different from our own world. And this is my artist, well, scientist impression of what I think this world might look like. So the, uh, the planet, or excuse me, the star would be very red in color, much redder than our own sun, because it's much cooler. The habitable zone is much closer in. Uh, the, a year would be only about three or four days on this planet. That's how long it takes to go around the, uh, the sun, so we'd all get a lot older a lot faster. But um, the other interesting thing is that uh, we would probably always have one side of our planet facing the star, just the same way our moon always faces the Earth just because we'd be so close in to the star. Uh, you can't really see it in this image, but uh, the star in the sky would actually be 10 times bigger than our sun. So it'd be about six degrees across. It would also look fairly dark. 
and I try to convey that in this image, because most of the energy from this star is actually emitted in the infrared wavelengths beyond where we can see. So although they, are, they give out a lot of energy, it's energy we can't see, so it would be a pretty dark environment. And any kind of crazy plants that might be on this world would also be fairly dark because they want to try and absorb all that energy they can. It would be pretty hard for them to live. And this is actually all modeling that, that people in my group have done. And uh, finally, though, I would say that, you know, we can't figure out any reason why such a world couldn't be habitable. It's a very different kind of world to think about than our own, but it's possible that this could be our home in 10 trillion years, is something that looks like this. So, my guide to saving humanity is that we have to first recognize the problem, that we need to realize that life needs energy. We need it from both a star and from below. And we're fortunate that the universe is in this kind of weird disequilibrium state. So this energy source, these energy sources are abundant. They're everywhere. We, should, we can possibly find this. We might have 40,000 possible uh, stars to check out, to figure this out. I've tried to argue that uh, these very small stars are the best places to look. They might be able to glow for 10 trillion years, and we might be able to find a way in which a planetary system is sort of configured so that we could actually provide some energy from below for, to, to sort of keep a stable climate on one of these planets for 10 trillion years as well. So the bottom line, what's underlined here, is that we need to find a tidally heated world in the habitable zone of a tiny star. That, I think, is sort of the, uh, the best place in the universe for life. Uh, as I've shown, though, it's, it's pretty hard to get there, but at least if we were trying to use sort of human technology, but if we uh, recognize that the clock isn't ticking that fast, we can use the Earth to sort of circle around the galaxy, find these planets, and maybe think about how we might migrate to them in a, in a long time. And finally, once we get there, then of course we get to enjoy 10 trillion years on, uh, on this planet. Uh, hopefully it'll be some sort of paradise. But once we get there, you know, there's certainly no reason to leave. Now, I put a little asterisk up here. And that's because there's a little <laughs> caveat at the end that I have to mention. And that is that, um, yeah, the universe is going to actually finally reach equilibrium. There's no longer going to be these nice little uh, chunks, these clumps of uh, energy and mass. And so eventually, the universe does, is going to reach equilibrium. All the stars are going to go dark. All the planets are not going to have any more energy in the interior. And uh, all life in the universe is going to end. So on that sobering note, I'm going to drink a beer, and I will conclude. Thank you very much. <laughs>